So back when I was in my college's anime club in the anime dark ages of the late 2000s, I saw a show called Vampire Night. And recently I saw it again on Netflix and I decided to tune in for a little bit of nostalgia <laughs> for the time that I was getting into anime and watch this show again and see if it was as strange but interesting as I remembered. So the basic premise of Vampire Night is there are vampires and there are humans and the story is set in a school where the humans attend during the day and the vampires attend during the night and it's sort of a project for the younger generation of vampires to learn how to cooperate with the humans. Although they don't really interact with the humans at all because they have completely opposite schedules so and in this world as well vampires are not not dead. They are more like a different species. They are longer lived, possibly immortal, they age more slowly, um, they can have families and give birth to children, but there are also vampires who once were human and turned into vampires because they were bitten. And it seems like most of these descend to something called level E, which makes them more like the mindless bloodless driven vampire um, of, of popular mythology and less like the intelligent, urbane, um, more human-like vampire that's more popular recently. The main character is Yuki, a human girl whose parents were killed by vampires and she was later saved by one of the good vampires called Kaname and she also has an adopted brother called Zero and his family were vampire hunters and they were also killed and he was bitten so there's a limited time left until he also descends into level E and becomes mindless and crazed with bloodlust and they want to obviously stop that from happening. So Vampire Night is a gothic melodrama with a love triangle um, with action scenes and a pl intrigue plot with bad vampires versus good vampires and it has a beautiful over-the-top gothic aesthetic. It's set in a pseudo-European country with lots of old buildings with a cool town with like cobblestone streets. The uniforms and the clothing are peak gothic. Um, I love how they have the regular human students in black uniforms, but the vampires are in these pure white, very ethereal looking versions of the uniforms. You would expect it to be the other way around, but no, like they make the vampires look like these angelic beings. Looking back, I can see how this fits into a gothic Lolita vibe. The ending song has the main character in a gothic Lolita dress holding a stuffed animal in a, like a very like Lolita inspired photo shoot and also one of the um, vampire girls who's kind of a minor character dresses in gothic Lilia style when she's not in her school uniform and she is a model as well and she often carries a parasol so I can see how this could be inspiration for a lot of people who are into that type of fashion. Of course both the opening song and the ending song of the first season are absolute bangers. <laughs> in anime club you generally want to, you're tempted to speed through the openings and endings because you're watching like 12 plus episodes of a, a season and it just gets boring to see the same thing over and over again but like I basically want to watch that opening every single time and the ending as well because they're both so such iconic music whether it's the high energy opening or like the slower more creepy and mysterious ending I love them both like you should look it up on YouTube for sure because they're some of the best anime openings and closings I've ever seen and they fit the show so perfectly. 
I actually appreciate the level of detail in this show a lot more now than I did when I first watched it. When I first watched it, I thought, okay, this is pretty corny. It's over dramatic. The characters are a bit over the top and there's a lot of like big emotional speeches and obvious drama and stuff like that. But it's also kind of weirdly addictive and the first season has a nice arc to it. Now I see like, yes, it is melodramatic. Yes, it is very pulpy, but I think the writers had a very distinct vision of what they wanted and they were thoughtful about the scenes they included to give character development and build tension and have nice vampire action and danger. For example, the initial mystery about whether or not Zero is a vampire only lasts a couple of episodes before Yuki catches on. And I like that because when she doesn't know, the conflict is very simple. Either she's going to find out or she won't. But once she knows, she has to make a decision about what she's going to do with that knowledge. And that's much more complex. For me, watching this again 10 plus years later, it was actually hard for me to finish the first season. About halfway through, it actually got really depressing for me and I had to stop it for a while. And that was because I felt so much for the loneliness of the main character, Yuki. And it was just very painful for me to watch her struggle with basically no support, no one on her side, no one she can even go to for advice. So a bit of rundown of the main characters. You have Yuki, who is your blank slate full action girl, basically. She has weapons to defend herself and she's willing to stand up to vampires, but you never actually see her um, attack anyone or hurt anyone. One of the boys always steps in to save her before she actually has to do anything too action-y because that's part of the fantasy that you're tough and you can defend yourself, but also um, you have hot guys who will swoop in to save you if you ever really get into trouble. But I do find Yuki overall a very likable character. She fits into more of a Japanese protagonist rather than an American protagonist mold. Like comparing her to someone like Bella Swan who's also in a vampire novel, Bella is a little bit more cynical, a little bit more closed off. Whereas Yuki is someone who maintains a very kind and cheerful exterior and she really tries to help people and she keeps her negative emotions tamped down. And I think that there is something really sad about that, but also really admirable. So she has her adopted dad, who is the headmaster at the school, and he obviously has a lot of affection for both his adopted children, but he's not someone who Yuki ever considers going to when she gets into a tough or confusing situation. He seems emotionally absent, even though he is providing the kids with a place to live and a place to go to school and the basic things that they need from a parent. I guess that is a little bit like Twilight because Bella can't really confide in Charlie either. So Zero is Yuki's adopted brother. Watching Yuki's relationship with Zero was, for me, at least one of the things that made the show painful because she clearly cares about him so much and is willing to do anything she can to support him and she's continually reaching out for him when he's hurt and upset and pulling away because he's dealing with his own stuff and he's continually pushing her away saying like I can't talk to the to you about this don't keep trying to help me blah 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 and seeing her continually reach out and get shut down like that with so little affection from someone who is the closest thing she has to a brother is really hard for me to watch. And to see her like continually push down her own emotions, put on a brave face for him, try to reach out, try to comfort him, and keep getting pushed away. So the other um, leg of the love triangle is Kaname, the vampire senpai to Yuki. And 
she has had a crush on him since she was a child and in that sense he's kind of the worst because there's the very strong sense that he's grooming her that you pick up more the older you get and it's kind of terrible and sadly he is one of the people who is more open to showing affection towards her and comforting her but he's also grooming her and you can see why she's more susceptible to that when her brother um, and her dad are <laughs> not as concerned about what's going on with her. What is particularly horrible for me to watch now is the episode where she goes to the vampire's dorm and falls asleep on the stairs. Um, this is when she's a little bit younger before she actually starts high school and Konami sees her and would like to bite her, being that she is human and he is a vampire, but instead in goes and bite, bites another vampire girl. And <laughs> because Yuki has to stay pure as, well, as snow, he can't bite her, but he can go bite another vampire because of Madonna War Complex. <laughs> it's It's kind of terrible. And he also kind of blames Yuki for falling asleep there and tempting him, which is another level of total yuck. In Konami's very slight defense, he will, when push comes to shove, he will do things he doesn't want to do because he knows that will help Yuki. He's the one who saves Zero from becoming a vampire at the end by letting Zero bite him. And obviously, that's not really something he wanted to do because he kind of resents Zero for being the object of Yuki's affections and being closer to her and able to protect her. But he does it anyway because Yuki wants Zero to live. And, eh, like, I don't think Konami's a good person, but that was an act where he put someone else first. So I give him a few credits for that, um, but not very many. Weirdly, the only person in Yuki's life who actually really cares about what's going on with her is her roommate, who doesn't even know about the vampire masquerade. So her ability to offer help is very limited, but she does have this sense of, hey, Yuki, you seem kind of sad. What, what's going on with you? Are you okay? And it is sad that she's the only person who like cares enough to ask that and she's such a minor character. So there is a lot about sex in this show. It is very horny and the older you get the more you pick up on it and some of the troubling sexual ethics on display. I mentioned that Kaname kind of has this Madonna whore complex and he slut shames Yuki but another like obvious aspect is that sharing blood between a vampire and a human is portrayed as very sexual. They embrace each other in an intimate way and they blush and their hearts start pounding in a way that's clearly um, meant to show that they're somewhat aroused. And that has many disturbing implications. You will mostly see males in the vampire role taking blood from women and to me like that really plays into the idea that male sexuality is somewhat inherently predatory and women are by their nature by their physical um, attributes in this case their the smell of their blood are kind of tempting men to give into their baser natures that does kind of play into this trope of women as temptresses, showing sex as something that is not inherently desirable for women. They'd only um, do it for some ulterior motive, either to tent men or to help a partner they really care about. And it's such a beautiful sacrifice, yada, yada, yada. But for me, it always seems like such a, like so prejudiced against men to show that their sexuality the thing they naturally want to do with someone they're attracted to and have feelings for is inherently predatory and damaging to the person they love. One of the big plot points in season one is that 
because zero is quickly deteriorating into a bloodlust crazed vampire and it seems like the blood supplements that are being used to keep the um, vampire students in line are not working for him. So Yuki decides that she will give her own blood to Zero to hopefully keep him sane a little bit longer. And the moral implications of that are a big part of the show. Like when I first watched the episode, I was like a little bit mad at like some of the shame that Yuki feels because to me it seemed like a, a selfless act, a sacrifice to help her friend. But watching it again, I do like agree a little bit more about the morally gray nature of it because Zero would very much prefer not to bite his friend and he does say no and Yuki pushes him to accept her blood. But I also don't judge Yuki too harshly because this is clearly not something she's doing for herself, but it's to save his life or to save his humanity. So another thing that's interesting that the show does, maybe by accident, is it demonstrates why giving someone a weapon doesn't automatically make them 100% safe. Yuki has a staff that helps her fight vampires and she's kind of the class monitor who is supposed to keep the night students, aka the vampires, in line. But even when she's ready to defend herself, she still has this respect for her senpai. Well, she can't automatically reframe them from her classmates and her superiors to monsters that she can just beat over the head with no hesitation. And I think that's true for a lot of the way real people feel, especially when you're discussing the way too nuanced for Vampire Night subject of sexual assault, that many people are assaulted by people they know, like at least acquaintances, if not friends. And going from this person is my friend and I want to treat them well to this person is attacking me and I should just beat them over the head to get them to stop is kind of a weird cognitive dissonance and people often can't automatically make that switch. Like, I mean, who could? You'd have to be kind of a sociopath. I was afraid that with the somewhat regressive sexuality um, in the show that the villain for the first season would be more painful to watch because she is a vampire woman, she's a powerful vampire, and I was afraid there's going to be this undertone of women shouldn't have too much power because it makes them evil and crazy, but actually watching the character, I really enjoyed how her storyline evolved and how much empathy and dignity they gave to this character. The main antagonist of season one is a pureblood vampire called Shizuka, and she is a terrible person and that's why she's a villain. She um, takes a child and allows him to drink her blood and that makes him stronger and healthier, but she is grooming a child and that's really weird and creepy. And she's the one who killed the rest of Zero's family. Her being evil doesn't diminish her femininity, but neither are the feminine coded aspects of the character portrayed as what makes her evil. She's a bad person and she's also a feminine woman and those thing things sort of both exist in the same time, but one doesn't really create the other. And I did appreciate how much nuance and depth they gave this character and showed why she was doing the terrible things that she did without really excusing them. With villains, particularly female villains, there is a temptation to defeat them by making them either monstrous or ridiculous. But Shizuka keeps her humanity all the way to the end, and she has such grace and resignation that I really just feel sad for her. It's an uncomfortable plot line, but I think the way it plays out gives a sense of closure and gives a sense of empathy to all the characters involved with this. So overall for the show, 
I get this sense that we really are meant to feel empathy for the female characters. For Yuki, certainly, we're supposed to see her as a good person. We're supposed to feel her struggles along with her, feel sad when she's sad, feel fear when she's afraid. And I think we're meant to have empathy for the few other female characters as well. But I also think that the show could question more the situation that these characters are put in. I think particularly <laughs> it could it could call Kaname out for being a terrible person, but that's just my opinion. I think that I would like to see Yuki go to her dad and say, look, you've got me studying normal high school, also managing the vampires, and also I have all these other problems in my life that I'm dealing with. This is, this is too much, man. Overall, I would definitely recommend the first season of Vampire Night if you like vampire stories, if you like melodrama, if you like cheesy high school romances with love triangles. Um, I'm not going to say any of that is high art, but if you want that done well with a really interesting story and likable characters or unlikable characters, then I would definitely recommend um, giving Vampire Night a watch because it's on Netflix. I haven't seen all of the second season, but I'm going to check it out and see whether it makes an interesting development on the first season or whether the first season um, having a complete arc is best watched by itself. Anyway, uh, thank you for watching. Those were some of my thoughts on Vampire Night. <laughs>